Okay, then. Then uh, we started the live stream now as well. And if Carla can also share again the, the presentation, of course, please. Of course. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, I actually wanted to just give you a little bit of context. I promise I'm not going to be long, but just to share with you why are we here and to share with you a little bit about the Shaping the Future of Europe campaign. So uh, this European cafe is actually the third uh, of a series of European cafes. We organized two before, one of fake news and one of extremist movements in Europe. This is a third one and is part of this Shaping the Future of Europe campaign or initiative. And what we are trying to do through this initiative, we are trying to organize different activities. Uh, and as it is written there as well, why do we want these activities? Because we want to hear what young people have to say. Uh, what they have to say about the shaping the future of Europe, what they have to say about the future of Europe, and of course to empower them to actually engage and not just share their opinions, but also do something about it. And you can learn more about the, the initiative on our Facebook page, Do One Brave Thing. We have European cafes. We actually have another uh, series of events called Youth Live. The second one is gonna take, part, uh, take place on 18th of March, and it's gonna be an escape room online. So you can go on our Facebook page. We're gonna share the link here in the chat as well. And you can go and register and take part in this uh, escape room. And something really exciting, we're gonna have a youth summit that's gonna be at the beginning of May. You're gonna find everything that you want uh, on our Facebook page and you can read there about the upcoming events. And also the next European cafe is gonna take part in, take place in one month. So, and it's gonna be about gender and extremism. So if you love this one, you can also take part there. Okay, Carla, can you move to the next slide? Second. Okay, uh, I also wanted to tell you because this initiative is not, random actually it's part of a bigger project that's called one by thing and this is one of the main reasons why we are here uh we also have here some of the the let's say organizers because this do one by thing project actually was created by a consortium of uh, ngos around europe uh i'm part of patria that's one of the partners we also have here from from budapest center we have kyrgy we have krista as well and um, you can you can read more about it on our Facebook page, on our Instagram page. We're also on YouTube. We are also this is the website. You can see it here in the slide. But what we are trying to do uh, with do one day thing, we're trying again to empower young people. But here we are trying to enc to encourage them to actually counter radicalization and extremism. And how do we do that? We encourage them to stand up and create campaigns. Uh, most of them were online. We had like a lot of trainings. We had boot camps. We we have a lot of amazing campaigns created by young people around Europe, uh, which are trying, as I said, to to counter radicalization and extremism. And you can read more about it on our website. You can find a lot of resources on the website about this topic. You can find resources on how to create your own campaigns. On uh, we also have like an investigation service where you can you can check your articles online. We have a lot of resources and you can find all of them there. And of course, if you have any questions about the project, uh, you can contact us. You can, after this event, maybe like uh, ask us uh, or just send us an email and for example, how you can get involved as well. So you can find all the information there. Okay, Carla, perfect. Uh, about today's agenda. Uh, as you probably noticed, we try to get to know each other a little bit, and I really hope you found some really interesting things about each other. Uh, we gave you a short introduction about the event and about the context. And uh, what are we going to do now? Uh, you're going to meet our speakers because, as you probably already know, uh, the, the aim of European Cafe is to, to discuss this topic that today is racism and uh, discrimination and how young people are challenging it in Europe. And we are going to discuss it uh, by uh, with our help, with the help with, of two of our speakers that are here, Sabina and Georgina. You're going to meet them right now. And after uh, that, they're going to give a short presentation on their work and experience and also on re two really interesting topics. 
And after that, you can ask questions based on the presentation and we can discuss about this topic because this is one of the main reasons why we are here. We want to we want to learn more about your opinion as well and what do you think, not just about the presentation, but about the topic of racism and discrimination in general. Okay, then let's begin. And Carla, you can, okay. And as I said, we have two amazing speakers with us. We have Sabina and Georgina, and I'm gonna let them when they start their presentation to also introduce themselves a little bit and tell you about their experience because it's really, really interesting. And I, I'm pretty sure you're gonna learn a lot of amazing things from them. And I'm gonna like give the mic to them. <laughs> and uh, don't forget if you have questions to, to ask them, you can write them in the chat, for example, if you don't want to, to forget them, you can ask after their presentation so we can, we can start the discussions as well. Okay, thank you. I think Georgina is starting, right? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, talk to you about the Roma communities in Europe, especially in Hungary, and a little bit about the anti-gypsism and the challenges what the Roma communities face uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. I start to share my screen. I think I just... Okay, if I am right now, you can see my screen. And... Yes, you can see now on a full screen, yeah? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, hello. I am uh, Georgina, I am a Hungarian Roma woman, and uh, I am board member of Pirenamence International Network, uh, which is a, a, a network to focus especially, uh, give opportunity to young Roma to be involved into the, the European voluntary opportunities, and also for non-Roma to, to, uh, uh, to non Roma to go to be volunteer in um, in Roma communities, and also we have uh, several uh, uh, trainings on anti gypsyism, human rights education, and uh, similar uh, uh, topics. And also we are advocating for the young uh, Roma rights in the European level. And I'm also a member of the advisory council on youth, which is a, a uh, youth uh, uh, youth council for uh, representing the young uh, uh, the youth uh, into the council of europe system <clears throat> yes okay. yeah so first of all the the roma uh, i Okay, so the Roma started their migration around the 11th century from India, and uh, through uh, several centuries, uh, we arrived to Europe in the 15th, 16th century. And nowadays, this uh, migration is uh, stopped. The most, uh, the majority of the Roma people are settled. Settled. We have uh, different uh, groups uh, in. Um, in uh, European countries, and they have different names. For example, in Hungary, we have the Ola or the Rumungro community, but in Germany, you might know the Sintos. In, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, France, for example, the Rand du Voyage or the Travelers in Great Britain or the, the Tale and the Hitanos in um, uh, the Gitanos in Spain who are speaking the language of Tala. <clears throat> in 1971, we had the World Congress of Roma, and there was uh, accepted the flag, the hymn uh, uh, of the Roma communities, and uh, they officially accepted the, the name uh, to call ourselves Roma. Uh, currently, there is 10, approximately 10, 12 million Roma lives in Europe, and we almost have communities. We almost have communities in every European countries. Um, 
what's the difference between gypsy and Roma? You might can ask this. It's clearly uh, the gypsy, it's a, it's a given name to the Roma communities. It's not what we choose to use. This is a, this is a very uh, negative and pejorative word that, uh, what can uh, use for uh, the Romani communities. We prefer to use uh, on Roma communities and uh, um, because of the other words that was given to us, it's not describing uh, us. Just in Hungary, uh, Hungary population around 10 million people, nine and a half million people. And uh, uh, based on uh, Istan Kemény researches, uh, approximately five, 600,000 Roma live. We have three bigger group, the Rungros, who are like, let's call Hungarian Roma. Uh, they are the majority, like 71% of the Roma community in Hungary is Rungro. You could might know as uh, they, they lost uh, their languages. Uh, they are very well integrated into the Hungarian uh, communities. The second biggest is the Ola community, where I am also belonging, and uh, they speak the, the language of uh, Romani. And we have a smaller group, the Bayash community, uh, which are uh, they are speaking the archaic version of the Romanian language. Uh, here, there is the, there is a, you can see Hungary. And uh, you can see the population of the Roma communities higher on the northeast side of Hungary and uh, the south part of Hungary. This part of Hungary is also, also the economically most disadvantaged parts of Hungary. Okay. Uh, uh, so the Roma communities has um, has a has a, a lot of very uh, negative and uh, discriminative. Um, so the Roma communities is the biggest minority group in Europe, but still they are the most uh, one of the most disadvantaged community. Even though um, we are uh, we are living in every country, almost in Europe they are living on the edge of the society usually. 80% uh, of them living in, uh, uh, based on the Fundamental Rights Agency reports, they are 80% of them mostly living in poverty. The, I would like to talk a little bit about what is anti-gypsism. The anti-gypsism is used to describe attitudes, behaviors, and structures which are against uh, gypsies but the gypsy as i mentioned it's uh, it's uh, not uh, it's not uh, it's not describing a group it's just uh, yeah it's not describing the group uh, anti gypsism real describes attitudes behaviors and structures which are anti roma this, uh, the first definition came from the Council of Europe, uh, Youth Department created the, the mirror. Mirrors, it's, uh, this, uh, this is the mirror, this is a manual on combating anti-gypsism through human rights education. And uh, this is where this definition came. The second definition is the anti-gypsism is a manifestation of individual expression and act as well as uh, institutional policies and practice of marginalization, exclusion, physical violence, devaluation of Roma culture and lifestyle and hate speech directed at Roma as well as other individuals and groups. Uh, and uh, yeah, sorry, okay. And this uh, definition came from uh, Piranamenta, one of uh, the last uh, publication of Piranamenta International Network, uh, Do You Study Manual for Combating Hate Speech and Anti-Gypsism Online and Offline. Uh, the, the, manifest, uh, the manifestation can uh, be 
very wild of uh, anti-gypsism. It can uh, it uh, can appear on the behavior of the uh, peoples on daily basis. But there is also we can talk about structural uh, racism towards Roma. Uh, here is um, you can see this um, picture how the anti-gypsist attitude can appear in uh, the life. Yeah. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Roma communities had to face uh, several challenges. Uh, for example, the, yeah, so uh, the Roma communities were especially, uh, it could be, it could be very dangerous, uh, the COVID-19, because uh, generally the, the Roma population has a better, ha uh, worse health condition than the, usually the majority, uh, the majority has. I have uh, some data, I try to find it. The life expen expen ex the life expectancy of the sorry of the Roma is uh, spectacularly shorter compared to other social groups. Compared to the majority population, the Roma have higher rates of uh, mortality and illnesses. Uh, Roma population has an average a life expectancy that is so the their life ex no oh, sorry I don't know <laughs> than uh, twenty years shorter than other social groups so which is very really high that's why uh, this data is came from the European Commission research from uh, two thousand fourteen and that's why the COVID nineteen could have been ex extremely dangerous uh, if there is broken into, for example, a Roma settlement. As we know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the education went for distant education or in some country where they were more lucky went to the online education. Uh, but the Roma communities and the children, they were basically excluded for this opportunity. It's also because um, because they didn't have enough devices, but uh, generally in the very poor uh, Roma communities, they had to face for the electricity poverty. So they couldn't join. Already very high, the dropout rate of the Roma kids uh, in, uh, in education. And uh, we don't have data yet, but probably this dropout rate uh, caused by the COVID-19 will grow because they couldn't follow the education and they couldn't go with it. The employment, like uh, uh, related to the employment, the, the Roma communities um, very often because of the lack of education, they uh, they are usually working on the informer, informal uh, education, or the, or in uh, they are doing seasonal works. Um, these uh, opportunities they were totally cut. Several Roma family uh, stayed during the COVID nineteen without any income, and because they sometimes they are working without uh, contract or. Uh, they don't have a contract, but it's uh, continuous and they are protecting them uh, with law. Uh, they were totally excluded for every kind of social help that was given to the, to the people during the COVID-19. The housing condition, sometimes it's very poor. Uh, it's also how I mentioned before, their health are uh, extremely in a, a danger because um, so sorry. so their housing conditions sometimes they have a very crowded home several generations is living together keeping the the measures what was given to avoid the, the transit transmitting the virus was basically impossible in a overcrowded roma homes um, and also they have lack of uh, 
tap water, so just the prevention from the virus, but was, it was given like, uh, like just wash very often your hand and uh, that was the very basic uh, things that the people, um, we were, people were told. And uh, that was basically impossible if you don't have tap water in your house. Uh, just in the new, uh, uh, new strategy of the European Union, they, they, uh, I, I think because of the COVID-19, they, uh, they, um, they would, uh, so they prioritize to improve the housing condition of the Romas, and it's one of the indicators to, to grow the, uh, make higher the number of the uh, houses in the segregated, uh, in the segregations uh, where the tap water is available for the living, uh, the citizens. There was also unequal access to information in general in Europe. Um, it's a picture what you can uh, see. They are coming from a civil society organization. I am uh, involved as a volunteer. Uh, there was, uh, they, they are working with uh, children and uh, working with uh, their children and their parents in a segregated part of my hometown page in Hungary. And they were, uh, they tried to give uh, hand sanitizer uh, and the mask for the people because just if we imagine where the income is very low, generally the, you have to spend all of your incomes for food and uh, uh, the, your bills, uh, daily months, like extra, extra, um, extra money. They don't really have for buying masks and uh, different type of uh, hand sanitizer thing. So that's what they are trying to distribute among the people. And also they had the, um, they established a little working group from uh, Romani women. They were, uh, they were suing masks uh, for the community members. And they also made, um, they started to collect uh, durable food uh, for the Roma communities and after giving it to them. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I went through very, very uh, quickly on my presentation and I, I missed a lot of information but I still wanted to share with you. Yeah. The COVID-19 virus is uh, highlighted the difference in differences between social classes and, and, uh, and the Roma are already a stigmatized group. If you are just thinking of the media appearance, you, you never really see the Roma communities uh, uh, only into crime uh, reports and uh, similar things. And that was just like what I would like to add here. When I talked about the COVID-19 difficulties, I talked about the disadvantaged Roma communities. You also have to see during the centuries, the Roma communities were described as a, as a homogene group, uh, but we are more, uh, we have very, very, hmm, we have a very, so we are not a homogene group. We have several subgroups, uh, different languages we are speaking. And uh, so that's what I wanted to say. Also our economic system, uh, economic situation is different inside the group, but the majority of the Roma communities sadly lives in poverty. That's also caused by their lack of uh, access and the structural discrimination what uh, Roma are facing. And, uh, and uh, also the segregated education, uh, also keeping them separate, segregated from the majority. Uh, yeah. I think uh, that's what I uh, think so far, but I have uh, other things to share with you. Just, uh, 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 I would prefer if we could go for, uh, for, uh, for a more, uh, so more uh, for discussing it together. And if you have question, I am uh, 
ready to answer them. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to Sabina and after we will go back to your question and I am ready. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Sabina, whenever you're ready, please start screen sharing. Thank you and thank you, Gina, for uh, your presentation. I'm very happy to be here with you. My name is Sabina Stoika and I'm also a Hungarian uh, woman who is also belongs to the Roma community in Hungary. And my background is a bit different than uh, Gina's. Um, I work as a pastor, minister in a church in Budapest. And I work with an international community, um, but I'm also involved uh, internationally with the reconciliation program, which is also church based. So this is my background and uh, this is where uh, I connect to today's topic, which is racism and discrimination. But I would focus more on the part when someone who faces racism and discrimination, um, what happens within that person. And I truly believe uh, mainly from my own experience, then when we, we uh, from basically from early childhood, when we face discrimination, racism, or even prejudice, that's something that slowly destroys the heart and it affects different parts of our lives. And um, I'm usually, I like to share stories and personal stories. So that's what you will hear from me today to help you understand uh, what does it mean to let's say go to a Hungarian school in Hungary uh, in I think 1998 when we still had uh, segregated schools in my hometown for example um, and what happened to me there and that might help you to understand what does it mean for a seven-year-old uh, kid to face prejudice or discrimination. So I was uh, ready to start primary school and in my hometown we had two schools one was the main school and then that, that same school had a separate building where the Roma students were supposed to go and we all knew like that building and that class they offer a lower quality education and my mom really wanted me to receive a good education so somehow she pushed through and I've been accepted to the main building to a special class, which was a music class as well. And I was the first uh, Roma student who was not going to the segregated building, but to the main school. So it was a big shock to everyone else because in the, in the minds of the other students and even teachers, the idea was that Roma students, they belong to that building. So why am I there? But for me, it was normal. I was excited to go to school, to start and meet my classmates. And during the first few weeks of the school, one of my classmates, uh, he invited me to visit uh, his older sister in another classroom. So I went with him. Uh, we entered the classroom to meet these older kids. And I still remember until today that there was this girl sitting at the piano because it was a music school. And she looked back, looked at me and said, please leave the room because you are stinky, you smell. And of course, uh, I was seven years old, so I had no idea what she's saying. I was crying at home. I was telling my mom what happened. And like, mom, I, I remember I told her, mom, I shower every day. I, I don't know what the problem is. And that was my first moment when I realized that I'm different and that means uh, to some that I don't belong in the same room with them, like I have no right to be there. And in, for example, African-American studies or race studies that is called color shock, when you first realize you're different than the rest and that means you have different rights or lower rights to be there. But that had a really big effect on me and then I tried to do everything not to be Roma. And that means I developed something called internalized racism. And you can read a lot about that. But personally, it means we took on shame. We become ashamed of who we are. And we try to do everything so that we, we are not associated with our own group. But it really slowly destroys the heart because it connects to self-hate. And also it, it really reflects on how you associate with your own group. So I didn't have Roma friends until I was like 21 years old. And 
as I was part of my home church in my hometown, I was the only Roma there. So I found myself in places where I'm the only Roma. Uh, but then when I was working uh, with the Reformed Church in Hungary, I started being involved uh, with uh, ministry towards the Roma communities. And I started seeing uh, the value in my own group. And I went through a process of healing when I really accepted my identity and then started seeing the beauty in it. And for me, the biggest help that, that was there is this workshop that I'm working with now. It's a reconciliation work called Healing Hearts, Transforming Nations. And this work is something that started out of Rwanda, Africa. And uh, I, th this is what I'm sharing with you today as a tool that helped me uh, to fight my own uh, problem with my own ethnicity. And then also how I've seen uh, people being reconciled with each other, overcoming racism, prejudice, and discrimination uh, as a result of going through this workshop because something happened in their hearts. Um, so I'm sharing you with just some uh, pictures. Uh, let me share my screen. So I know we are talking about Europe, but this is something that has been already uh, uh, used in Europe, but to, for us to understand what is the um, effect of a work like this, uh, we need to see the situation where it helped. And I always say that if we find something that could help in a country, country like Rwanda, and I will share in a few minutes what happened there, uh, that gives us like a huge courage and, 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 and faith to see like it can help in our own context as well. So you see Rwanda is in, it's a small country in Africa. That's, that's where, you, where you see it. And I've been there twice, um, being trained and then teaching there, uh, being involved in this work. And I've been told by people like, oh, Sabina, don't go there. It's very dangerous. There is civil war there. But at this right moment, uh, Rwanda is beautiful. It's one of the most developing countries. Uh, they have the biggest guerrilla uh, conservatories. So they are uh, helping to maintain them and they're doing a lot for climate change. Uh, Rwanda is one of the most ecological countries in whole Africa. You cannot even bring plastic bags in the country. They are not using any. And the culture is beautiful. So I just find something. So even after what happened to them in 1994, which was a genocide, uh, the country is beautiful today. People are proud of their culture and they have amazing things that uh, they are proud of. So it's just some background about Rwanda. But what happened in 1994? As you might have heard, in 1994, a genocide happened in Rwanda, uh, where during the Holy Week of Easter, uh, in like 100 days, 1 million people were killed and many became refugees, orphans, widowed, and not just the people who died, but there were a lot of people who were raped, uh, who, who were tortured, and the whole country was destroyed. Imagine what like 100 days, like how many killings happened in 100 days to reach 1 million. And people think it just happened quickly because it did happen quickly. One day, they just announced in the radio, uh, cut down the tall trees, which was a propaganda uh, and it happened. But basically it was a, a process of 70 years of raising hatred, racism and prejudice between two groups. And who are these two groups? Uh, they are called the Hutu and the Tutsi. And the Tutsi were the minority in the country, but we need to know these are not tribes of Rwanda. They were created by the Belgium uh, colonizers and uh, they, they used like some fe features and they basically favored this small group of Tutsis and started calling them Tutsis and they placed them into leadership. 
But then this small group started to oppress the majority that became the Hutu, but basically these are like socio-ecological groups because before the colonizers, Rwandans lived in, in clans. So um, during these uh, years, there were many atrocities, uh, hate campaigns, and they used propaganda, as I said. Uh, Hutus, who are the majority, uh, started calling uh, the Tutsis, the minority cockroaches, uh, tall trees, snakes. So they really used the hate campaign and they really dehumanized uh, these people. And when, a pre when the president died, the, the, the plane was shot down. Uh, the Hutus became very scared or they were made scared that now they will be oppressed again by the Tutsis and they started killing them. But by dehumanizing them, it, doesn't, it didn't matter if you're a woman, if someone is your wife, if you are going to the same church, if someone is a child and even child in the womb. They use brutality, brut like ways that we cannot even imagine to kill. Um, and a lot of people died. People killed members of their own families, uh, the neighbors uh, that they had. And now they have a genocide museum in Rwanda. This is a picture from the museum where you can find the real faces of people who died. And there is a room dedicated to children who were killed. That's what dehumanizing mean when someone is called being a snake or a cockroach. And we've seen that in another parts of our history here in Europe, it's easy to kill. So in this room, you see these faces of children and the ways they were killed. And it just brings closer to you what really happened uh, in Rwanda. This is another someone who was 15 months old. And this is a place where people can also go to commemorate the, the dead because many bodies are still not found until today. Uh, with the organization called Rabaginara in Rwanda, uh, I work with them. They also use ways of art to uh, promote reconciliation. And in this photo, you see a Tutu and a Tutsi, two people who are connected because of the result of the violence that happened. You see the heart that is bleeding, the victim, and you see the hate on the other side and all the different uh, weapons that were used uh, to kill in the country. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just sh sh so we can see each other until I show more photos. So what we've seen, this is what happened in Rwanda. It, it was a result, as I said, to many years of hate campaign. Uh, but what we also see, and which I want to share, that the church was not innocent. Uh, 90, I don't know, like 81, 88, but definitely above 80% of the Rwandan population were attending church every Sunday. That means they were going there. They were listening to the sermons. They were worshiping God with the neighbors during Holy Week that then the next day they killed. So the Rwandan church was not innocent. And that means uh, we see different parts of Rwanda now where churches are now memorials because what past, some pastors did, they gathered the people from their own congregations, the Tutsi, and then they opened the door for the Interhamve, which was um, the people uh, who killed uh, um, organized, uh, in an organized way, and they killed the people in the church. And it happened many places. So uh, we asked the people asked the question, so what's wrong with the church? What was preached from the pulpit um, if it could lead to something like this? So the answer when they asked, what can people do? What can do, the church do to help Rwanda rise uh, from this disaster, to help people change so this never happen again? They said the church first needs to heal because if the church doesn't heal, cannot transform people, which would be the role of the church to transform hearts, then it will happen again. So the, the program I'm working with, it's, it basically connects to churches and offers the workshop to churches and people who are there 
And this is how the ministry started. Um, so this lady in the center, she is Rhiannon Lloyd. She is the one who started the ministry a few weeks after the genocide happened. She was walking between dead bodies and she started bringing people together. And the two gentlemen who are standing at uh, her side, they are from the two, tri two groups, I'm sorry, not tribes. On the left, uh, Elia, he's a Hutu man who killed many people, including the family on the person of, on the right. And these two men met at one of the workshops. And at that time, Elia served his prison sentence, but in Rwanda, people who confessed what they did, they could go back to their own communities, the very place where they killed people and had to live there and do uh, different uh, community work. So Elia went to this uh, workshop. Uh, he repent, like he really took uh, responsibility of what he did and uh, he was seeking this gentleman's forgiveness and at this workshop uh, he kneeled down this man and with tears and with all all the guilt that he had he begged for the forgiveness of this man and this man forgave and when this man on the right and I forgot his name unfortunately Gaston um, he asked Elia to be his best man at his wedding so this is for me a picture of full reconciliation of overcoming uh, our own hate, but also our own pain and, and starting a life that is new. So in this photo, which was also painted, you see it's based on a Bible passage, but you see this uh, beautiful water flowing out from the church, giving life to Rwanda and then to Africa and then to the whole world. And that is our vision that this uh, gift that Rwanda has been given after the genocide and how people are forgiving one another and creating communities of reconciliation, that is a gift that we received in Europe and they're showing us ways that we can forgive and repent and overcome our own prejudices and racism. So I've been working with this group and they have an international school of reconciliation every other year in Rwanda where people from all over the world are coming now. It reached different parts of Africa, but and Asia and now Europe as well. And the workshop itself, we use different uh, biblical ideas and also uh, psychological and uh, cultural ways to help people understand. And some topics we use are understanding prejudice, overcoming it, working with our own, own ethnicities. How can we uh, be proud of who we are and see God's, God's glory. That's what we use, but basically the beauty in other peoples. And then we also work with the pain and transgenerational pain uh, of the individuals. Um, and, and also we work with trauma that was caused by the result of uh, racism and discrimination. This young lady, uh, she's Nyakuma and she's from South Sudan. And at the, we participated in the same school and she said, she's not, um, Sabina, I'm not eating meat. Um, and I was like, okay, you're a vegetarian. And she said, no, it's not by my choice. She said, I've seen, I was laying between dead bodies because of the civil war in, in my own country between the tribes. And when I look at the meat itself, it, the bodies are what coming to my mind. But at the same workshop where we attended, uh, this young girl who is also a mother and, and uh, she forgave, uh, she experienced uh, forgiveness and acceptance by his own uh, uh, people from different groups from her country, but also experienced that with Europeans, uh, which uh, it was very hard for some of them because they see our responsibility in different things that are happening in Africa now and in the past. I've seen like African men cry together, which is like, you know, we see men don't cry and ask for forgiveness from one another, from the hate and, and discrimination and pain they caused. Uh, as, as I said, it's a Christian workshop. So we, we do uh, have a time when we spend time with God and we try uh, to let go of the pain that we experience because if there is pain in our hearts because the different uh, 
uh, hurt that we've been experiencing by other ethnic groups and different things, then if that pain is there, there will be no room to forgive. So only after we could deal with that pain, forgiveness can come. And how does youth come? In Rwanda, the biggest uh, groups that are leading this ministry now are students. So when I was there as my first practicum, I was leading this uh, for students. Uh, and this is just a video when they were releasing some pain. Um, and these are students who were uh, carrying transgenerational pain, shame because their father is in prison because he killed or experienced, witnessed with their eyes how uh, the, the whole family got killed. And in the room, they had to be with people from with each other groups in a situation now when in Rwanda, you cannot really talk about which group you belong to. And this was a beautiful moment for me. And that's why I wanted to show you. And when we burn these papers where the pain is written and no one else reads it, then we place these flowers and we do two things. One, the flowers are signed that beauty can come out of ashes and as, as Rwanda rise from the pain and individuals, there is hope. So that's the biggest sign of hope for them, but also for us everywhere when we are overcome by how people are treated unfairly and by the discrimination and racism we face, there is still and there is always hope. And that's a reminder of that. And one more story, and then I move to Hungary. Uh, I know I have two, a few more minutes left, sorry. Um, this is something I witnessed with myself. And this is what gave me the biggest courage to see that this is possible in Hungary. And, and Roma people and majority of people can reconcile because if this could happen in Rwanda, it can happen in Europe as well. So what happened on this photo? This gentleman was the same man from the other picture, Elia, who is now a big role model in this work. And he killed the big family of this lady. And this lady couldn't forgive him for all these years. This happened in 2018. So from 94 till 2018, she was carrying this hate towards this man and they were living in the same village. And at this time, the lady came to the workshop and at this moment, Elia begged again for the forgiveness of the lady. And the lady said, I know this is time to forgive and she forgave from her whole heart. And after that, she stood up and this simple African lady said, I know what reconciliation means. That means I'm not the only one who is forgiving you, but I want to be reconciled and you should come to my home. And when people share homes, <laughs> when you have people from another group in, in your own, house that's what overcomes any discrimination and racism because that means being close and recon close and reconciled and this is a photo you received he did visit the home and met the whole family these are some students i work with uh, the two on my sides uh, they were there at 2018 and then i met them in 2020 last year and they still kept telling me how the workshop helped them uh, to overcome their own self-hate. The lady, I think uh, she's Hutu and the, and the gentleman, his whole family was killed. He's Tutsi and he, they said two things. The lady said, I, I can accept who I am now. And the gentleman said, one I think I remember is forgiveness and that forgiveness is for me and now I'm free. And now we move to Hungary. This is a workshop we did in Hungary with Roma and non-Roma. And another one on this photo as well, where we already trained facilitators who can now lead the workshop in Hungarian uh, with the leaders from uh, all over the world. They were coming uh, to uh, Hungary to lead the workshop. Um, and I, I will say two more things, but I stop share screen. So we brought this workshop to Hungary and also the Balkans and different parts of Europe. And I've seen that the same, uh, same things that were happening in Rwanda are happening here. And I've seen 
how um, Hungarian people from the majority in Hungary were asking for forgiveness from our Roma brothers and sisters for the ways we've been treated in schools, how they are not sitting next to us on the bus for mistreatment. And I've seen the release and the forgiveness that uh, the Roma brothers and sisters uh, gave when they forgave. But I also seen as Gina, Gina said that our groups are not homogeneous and we also have discrimination between Roma groups. And I've seen how um, Roma people between themselves could ask for forgiveness by how um, they're using and mistreating and exploiting their own people. So I've seen all these different ways, asking teachers, asking for forgiveness, how uh, kids are mistreated in school, uh, doctors, uh, lawyers, police. And I've seen at the end of these workshops how people are celebrating each other's cultures together. And it's not just there for these three days where the workshop lasts, but then it continues after. And as in Rwanda, I do see a big role of youth doing this work. And it's something that um, it's needed, I think, in any uh, country. But my biggest passion is uh, to do this a lot with uh, Roma communities and majorities in Europe. So thank you for listening to me. I know I was longer, but um, I appreciate your patience. So thank you. Thank you so much to both of our speakers. Um, now we will move on to the next part. So if you have any questions, now is the time to ask them. I have a question. Uh, what's the best way for white people to help uh, Roma people into uh, combat racism? Hey, um, good question. There is several ways. Um, for example, if already if you are showing example with your life and you are showing to your friends and like uh, giving it the the non discriminative approach to other people, I think it's already a help. But if you wish, you can also be engaged in uh, Roma uh, civil society organization works. You can do volunteer work in this. Also, if you would like to know more, you can uh, participate on trainings uh, held on these topics to get in deeper and uh, get closer. But I think is the best is like your personal example, what you are showing to the world. Thank you. Yeah, I can also add something. My biggest motto is uh, make sure you, like I could connect to the project, do one brave thing. And sometimes that is have a friend who is Roma and that's something and visit their home and then have, have connection because we can educate ourselves. You can ask people about what does it mean. But once you have a friend, then it's natural and then I think that's something that uh, should happen uh, and that's something that helps. And that's what, what I hear from older Hungarians saying like, oh, in my time, it was normal to have Roma classmates and have friends and grow up in the village with them. So I think that's something we should try to get back to. Yeah. Thank you. If I can also add something here, this is, I guess, a question for our speakers, but it can also be a question for everyone else in this call. Like, how do you think, because this is something like listening to, to Georgina's and Sabina's presentations and seeing what you are doing. I was thinking like, how can we, like young people especially, but like, how can everyone actually do something so so we can we can combat racism in general and like these kind of issues because you are talking about forgiveness for example and how people are forgiving themselves and about reconciliation but most of the time i feel like we are not doing something because we we just think okay it's not our problem so why we would for example someone from romania go to rwanda and help people there so this is also something maybe for for the others if they can share like how can we what can we do actually to 
to help and also like to to overcome these issues around us i think that i'm just something that came to my mind as you were speaking like it's always the question how can we know something we do not know and mass racism and prejudice are in our own uh, societies so something we do in these workshops we work a lot about how do we see and realize our own prejudices and that's something like yes i went there i went to rwanda to help but the idea is that we do the same thing here and how we stop using uh, sentences like yes yes i have no problem with roma people but or i have one roma friend who is different or oh you're not roma because you're different so sentences like this which are hidden racism it's i think for me that's how we have to start and that has um i think in our own small group uh roxana was saying like we have to do something and when we hear an unfair sentence or something we do we need to find times to call that out and but it's always on my opinion it always starts with us individuals so that's that's something that we could help with and then we have friends and family and that's a great responsibility already i also uh, feel it's uh, usually everything caused by distance between communities and as i said like it was very easy to scapegoating the roma communities as a transmitter of the virus because they are they are further from the majority so they are excluded they are outsider so it was very easy to scapegoating them and this is their fault we are sick because they are here or and this is always happening in a in a Europe with the Roma communities and like they are poor but it's their fault yeah but they have they they are living in a structural discrimination they don't have uh, equal access for education and after uh, they are um, this is uh, going from generation to generation and they cannot break out from the power the cycle of poverty because they have no opportunity for this because the system is not giving them an opportunity so just what i wanted to say it's uh, it's uh, it's really like uh, like try to try to implement the anti-racist approach in your life in your work like even if uh, if you have like uh, if you are working in a civil society or you are volunteering in your civil society try to think uh, are we enough inclusive do we have a program that is like available for the disadvantaged uh, communities or for example poor roma can also access to this opportunity for example this event like we are talking about racism but we are holding it online like the the group we are talking about sometimes it, the the poorer people cannot access for this so they cannot see like we are talking about this but they don't know If I may, here for me, being a bit um, coming from another generation than you are, with some experience, uh, lived also before the change of regime in in Hungary, and when that time really uh, the 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 problem of Roma was not a problem. At least it was not in the public discourse, and uh, well, so this is at one point. Uh, it is also true that uh, that time the education for roma was a normal thing so in each class there were roma students uh, there was no segregation but why i asked the, for for the floor is that um, you speak that uh, you have to speak up in your own community community and then it will already help and um, i also shared this view for a long time for the last few years i i'm thinking about um, how to what can we do to make a to achieve a structural approach as you said here so it is not enough that you convince one two three persons you know being in your environment if we do like this if we continue like this in my view then we shall never reach that the majority of the population will lose 
its anti-Roma sentiments. Uh, if we just try to raise um, the issue with some, some Roma people, we shall just try to encourage some of the Roma young people. Okay, out of the, let's say so, 1 million, there will be 100. Let's say so, 1,000, and then what? How can we achieve that 1 million uh, Romani people will be encouraged? How can we achieve that 1 million Romani people will be educated? So, and for me, it's a, I call it as a so-called whole society approach, that we need to, to convince, to get the politicians, first of all, to give up their anti-Roma sentiments, their anti-Roma language, uh, way of thinking. Uh, secondly, we need to achieve that uh, this, somehow the education and all what you say about the poverty and all these things will be spread in the whole society, not only in one part of Hungary. Uh, maybe we can start with that, but in my view, this step by step, small steps, okay, these are better than nothing, but in my view, this is not enough. And I'm thinking I don't have the answer. I just wanted to highlight for as my dilemma, my personal dilemma, you know, that how we can change this current situation in the terms of the whole society. And so that's what we need to think also about. Because you will get uh, Sabina and Georgina, old like I am, and still you will have the same problem if we continue like this. And this is my, my, my basic uh, dilemma. Sorry for speaking long, but I just wanted to share it with you, my dilemma. Can I say something to that? Yeah. I think like um, on the basis, I agree with what you're saying, but I do see the need for both approaches because if the approach just comes from the top, it could uh, uh, rise more hate in the, in the majority. So if it's something that is enforced, uh, any systematic change that is enforced, it could be, it could be the source of, uh, of different um, uh, hate that could develop more in people. And we, we already seen that in Hungary. I'm seeing that through the Reformed Church and the responsibility that the church is taking in Roma communities and then how that creates conflicts in, in the local church, local community. So um, I believe, uh, and that's why uh, I became involved in the work I'm doing now, that structural, structural change should happen, but I believe in local change, in, it means local community change. So we are changing communities locally. That means, which I didn't say in these workshops, people who are living in the same village and town are participating. So people who are already parts of each other's lives. And then I agree that when one, one teacher changes and then it reaches people who have power in the society, then I believe they, are, they can change systems as well. But you're also right. If only uh, individuals are changing, and I can speak about the Reformed Church itself. Let's say a Roma person wants to go to a Reformed Church on Sunday and wants to get close to Hungarian people and forgive them already, but then you go to church and they tell you to sit in the back seat, or this is not the clothes you should wear to church, then the pain is reinforced. So I do, so I, I do think both are needed, but I do see the dilemma you have, and I, I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, sorry to come back to you because uh, you might have misunderstood me. I don't say that we have to we have to force the people from the top now. We have to force the politicians to give up their hate speech, their hatred, or they they fueling uh, hate, you know. And we can we much force them, the politicians, to introduce structural changes. You know, that's the, so to to change the structure of the education, to change the structure of the of the of the of the of the economic situation of the people and 
also i don't i'm not afraid of this word to also apply positive discrimination in the case of the uh, roma people i know the the Euro european union officially they don't like it. so no pos no discrimination as they say in the in brussels i say yes but still there is positive discrimination is it's something because without this you can't make progress i i I agree with the part like uh, it's the role of the politicians and the media is really important uh, how the hatred and the racism fueled. We have seen several very, very bad examples, even in Hungary, like if you remember 11, 12 years ago, six people were died, uh, six people were killed in, in, uh, because, of, uh, because of a racist attack. So that was really a hate crime that happened in Hungary just a few years ago, like 12, 11 years ago, among them a five years old Romani boy. So if you just remember this, and that was fueled, it started all with the politicians, uh, individual. Uh, um, so they, they wanted to build a politician career and they built it all hated. So that they used the Roma communities to build their politician career and pushing them the Roma. So that started the all things, but I don't believe in, uh, in, uh, in a positive discrimination. I believe in uh, equal opportunities. Related to, to this discussion, because I recently I was I was doing a research for another project on hate speech in Romania, and I was checking this that like the main actors of spreading hate speech are politicians, and I was also thinking while you are talking that this is one of the main problems because we are talking about how individuals can do, how young people can do, and they are doing a lot of things. The civil society is doing a lot of things, but then you have the main actors that are actually the politicians and there are a lot of people who are looking up to them, you know, they are seeing them everywhere. They are feeling that they are model in lives and so on. So how how can we, because Georgi were saying, okay, we have to force these people to, uh, to um, don't use hate anymore, but how can we do it? Because I feel like they are so confident when this is happening in Romania and I think it's happening in a lot of countries. For example, against Roma people, they, we had the president like feeling so confident a long time ago, just talking, like spreading hate in his speech about Roma community and blaming them. And he's doing it on national television and probably millions of people are watching it and then talking about it. And how can we convince them to actually give up on hate and be more inclusive and so on? Just if I, I add something quickly and after I will reflect on everything, but <clears throat> uh, I, I think Romania is the first country in Europe accepted uh, legislation and they are banning now for the, um, uh, the anti-gypsism. So uh, this, they are the first country. So I think Romania already made a step to somehow combat uh, anti-gypsism. And uh, that can be the way for the other um, states of the Europe. Uh, Europe. And uh, just for the other things, like what can we do with the politicians? I think because I truly believe in uh, youth participation. I think the one of the way is to 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 give the proper. Um, opportunity to young uh, Romani people to be involved uh, into politics and if uh, we are represented into the politics uh, that's that can be a way to combat like if because now the Roma community see politicians only to three TV or in articles but if the Roma are uh, also involved and they are sitting in the same uh, same um, room together, I think that can be the way how we can uh, do something, but we have a long way to go there. We already have several good examples for countries. There is, a, um, but there is still a long way. Yes, but here comes the question, you know, that uh, how can you as activists 
uh, encourage your compatriots, Romani compatriots, to also speak up, to also, um, uh, I'd say, stand up uh, if necessary. And Georgina, when you said that, uh, what can we do if somebody says something wrong from the politicians? You, as young, young people, will have to mobilize your uh, friends uh, and go to the street and uh, say, look, what you said, it's, uh, it's something uh, awful and so on. So uh, if you, as people who has a long future, uh, will not start speaking up and uh, standing up uh, in a young generation, then this is, uh, you cannot expect that the, the uh, elderly people, the, grand, the grandfathers, uh, grandmothers will, uh, will stand up. Uh, can, I, can I reflect on this? Um, okay. So I, I, I think two things here. One thing, like, uh, like I, 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 uh, I don't want to push too much on, on disadvantaged Roma communities. Like you have to stand up for yourself. If on a daily basis they have uh, problems to provide food for the, the children in the family. And in the other case, there is, we recently, the, the, we have growing number of educated uh, young Roma. Like for example, uh, we are also participating with Sabina in the in the Reform Church uh, uh, special scholarship program for Roma students, and we also feel a lot of pressure on us. Like now, we are the generation who change have to change everything. That's a lot of pressure of this uh, on these uh, young people we are seeing, and there is few of us who committed, we are really would like to work with this, but I also totally understand a few of them, they just want to be good in their profession. They want to be a good lawyer, they want to be a good economist, and I think this is also, they are doing great. I mean, this is also very important. To majority see, we are not, we are, we are not uh, all uh, like, I, I want to say that like we are not all like, examples of our community we are roma and we are good in professional and this is an example and not all uh, as that like we are good in our work in our profession and we are also all the time advocating so i choose to this path for myself because i am interested in it and i would like to help for the roma communities but you cannot expect this from every uh, roma um. And I think, that was, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's all for my sign now. Yeah, I just started thinking about what you were saying also, Gina. So I think I lost a bit track of the initial comment, but um, like, yes, the pressure is there. And, um, and I know where you're coming from saying like, yes, we also need to say that that is not okay. And it means like, it always has to be something like that is, uh, an effort from both sides because that's the only thing that could bring change. So I think that's what you were saying. But for me, the problem is, and I'm sorry to say this, but one of the hardest uh, comments of prejudice and racism and discrimination towards Romas were coming from Romas, in according to my experience. So when uh, Roma communities, and that's like something that we see in the world that oppressed communities, uh, can become diverse in a way of becoming racist and prejudiced and discriminatory because there is this big need that I want to feel higher. I want need to put someone lower than me. So that means minorities are always more prone to racism, discrimination and prejudice and they don't disclude themselves out of that. So that means Roma people, according to my experience, um, they agree. So when the politicians say Roma people are like this, they say, of course. So then what can we do? <laughs> That's the question. So I'm going back again. And in one of the small groups I was in, we did say, yes, education is needed in, in this area. And we don't talk about in school about these things. We, we don't talk about um, this in different platforms of our society. And I'm coming from a church perspective. We do not talk about this in church. 
So I think platforms should be open. Uh, and this is a platform we, assess, we can access because we are involved in, uh, in, in social movements. So this is a platform for us. But the question is, how can other platforms be created? Uh, and that's something uh, I think it's a hard uh, part in social activism because it becomes very narrow of the people who are involved and then how other parts can be open. And I see my part is the church. So that's how I connect to that. But there are different parts of the society that should be open to this conversation. Uh, I would like to add on what you said earlier. Uh, do you think that discrimination between the Roma communities is caused by uh, internalized racism or anything of that sort? My quick answer is yes, on one side. Um, and then also like what Gina was saying, differences between the different groups. But when people are not aware of um, the difference between groups, um, and then I think I more follow the idea of uh, family identity in Roma communities, not group identity that's been enforced by sociologists, but family, bigger clan or family identity. So it's between families, but it's because of internalized racism as well. So of course, group identity and internalized racism both are there. I also would like to add something here because I'm not uh, hundred percent agree with Sabina on these things, but you see like the Roma community is so diverse. We have different opinions on things. <laughs> Sorry for the joke. Okay, uh, so what I wanted to say, so when we talked about the, uh, talked about the, the Roma who are uh, agree with the politicians on uh, when they are have they have statements about Roma communities, like this is, I think it's happening because the Roma community generally uh, added a so negative stereotype, uh, so they are like. Uh, they're thinking the poverty and the Roma community is equal. Every Roma is criminal. So that's what, and they just try to be the Roma communities who broke out from the, who came out from poverty and they are living on the uh, standard living of, with the majority of the majority. They think this is how they can feel more closer to the to the middle class of the society if they uh, they stay the, they they show they are agree with the politicians who are uh, accepting this because they are afraid they will uh, also be going to be stigmatized by the aroma. So if there is this general problem. What uh, we see like the Roma are stigmatized with so many negative things and for the other things i also don't really see this drastically the 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 the, the internalized racism so i i i i, um, I don't think it's uh, something what uh, uh, like it might have between communities but uh, generally, I think it's not, uh, I think it's more problematic when the majority uh, stigmatize us with, uh, with uh, negative uh, things. But that's the same thing. So the result of stigmatization is internalized racism. So it's uh -huh. interconnected. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm sorry, I have to go. I wrote to Florina, I have another meeting, but um, really enjoyed being part of this and continued the great conversation thank you so much for being uh, here sorry for leaving bye bye <laughs> bye thank you if you have any more questions like related to sabina's airline we can we can uh, share with uh, with her and i wanted also to ask if maybe i don't know daria or uh, yanira or Roxana and Luisa, if you also want to share your inputs on this, you can also do it because now we are in a free discussion space, so <laughs> there is no more moderating. Yeah. Because we're discussing about like what can we do and what can young people do and also how we can convince other people to act and react. So maybe you also have your inputs on this. Uh, me personally, 
the biggest, but no, the most important thing uh, for me was to learn to not be afraid to speak up when someone says something about another person based on their race or their religion or anything that they can't change. And I think it's important to be loud but kind, uh, really the theme of the event and to not let things like this go away without pointing it out. Okay, oh, sorry. Uh, I really agree with all uh, that you guys say, because I think that young people have to be in college to talk about things, to participate in the, in the public uh, discussion about racism and other problems in our society. Uh, most people uh, are ignorant about certain things, but is the result of the education that they have of the and the groups that they are in. So I think that when you guys talk about the politicians that are, we have not only in the case of Romania, in Portugal too, we have the these politicians that are populist uh, using blaming certain groups of things that are not their responsible, they are not responsible for. So I think that right now we need to um, show that young people, uh, we need to show that young people is ready to, is a, is a group that need to be taken account um, in this discussion and, and need to be, because most of the things, certainly in Portugal, we have this party that is using the, I don't think that is believe it, but this is a technique, it's a political technique uh, to engage more people to have more support for the public society. So right now we need to we need to show that we young people need to be considered as as a, as a part of the electoral group that need to be taken account for the politicians. So I think is this. So you're not very good with my English. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, don't worry. Uh, I have a question for everyone here. So with the rise of populists or extremists or right wing leaders, what do you think the future of Europe will be like? I really hope that as time passes, more left-wing uh, younger people are going to take control over the government and the uh, power in uh, Europe. So I, I don't think we are going downhill. I think we are um, slowly but surely uh, progressing. I think I'm not as optimistic because um, I'm kind of from the countryside and I also know quite a few young people who also show these tendencies um, like supporting right wing parties and yeah it's just it's very difficult in discussions to um, actually convince them with my arguments because um, especially if we have politicians that support you know, like different kind of facts or that just shout out different kind of opinions, um, then it's so hard um, on a, like on a personal level um, to convince other people with your own arguments, if you know what I mean, because you're, you just don't appear as smart probably as politicians do. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's very, it's a very difficult question. And of course, I hope that we can all contribute to having a different kind of future, but yeah. And at least in Germany, we have very bad tendencies and COVID just makes it worse again. Um, sorry. Uh, I'm, to, I'm very negative about the 
the answer to the question that are being problematized by right wing populism. Um, even if they are in, not in power, their ideas are penetrating the society and the public uh, policies. And this is very threatening to. Um, like others, I don't have a, I don't have a, a certain, a certain answer uh, in how to how to deal with this. It's very frustrating because it seems that we we are not talking with the, we are not talking with with. Um, it seems that we are we are talking we are talking with uh, about the thing that is should be recognized as simple, but is not. So <laughs> I'm here to learn about this too. I think, okay, sorry for the no, go, go. I, This is what I want to say because I know you unmuted yourself, so maybe you can go next. Okay. Uh, yeah. So one of the worst thing is like doing into the into the debate with the populist because because they are it's like basically impossible. They are always truly convinced they are right and and the, what I think the only only way we can fight with this uh, fight with populism is knowledge and information and to spread the information as wide and accurate numbers, accurate data, and like the reality. Um, I think this is the way. And I am really afraid for the growing extreme extremism in Europe, uh, especially because the Roma communities are really, really targeted of the extremists. Um, and I'm really afraid of the oppression of uh, all of the minority groups in Europe because uh, because they are targeted by the extremists and so far even from the populists so it's like I really afraid from the future I try to stay uh, bright in the meantime but I see what I I think I I have seen a little bit what's going on on a, on a, on a political level and I, I try to see also what's going in a reality, and I really don't don't like how the how the things are coming down from the daily life and how it's uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, coming into the the, the civilians' lives. So like how dividing Europe. It's like it's like really dividing for two. Like, I'm really afraid of this to see what's going on. Yes, I'm, I'm personally in the same mood, let's say opinion with you as well. I'm, I'm not really optimist. In a way, I feel like we, I was reading, I don't know, for example, just making the parallel with this, but I was reading like, we are gonna achieve gender equality in 100 years. I also feel like we are not gonna, like we're gonna live with hate a long long time and with racism especially but at the same time why i'm optimist is because i feel like we've also come to a point where people are talking more about it where we have more supporters as well we have more initiatives and i think that i don't know in 20 years in like 20 years ago because of like of course the technological uh support and everything we didn't have these kind of meetings and we didn't discuss about about racism in public or pri private sphere and I feel like we are doing it now and this is a first step because I, I don't want to brag about our project but this is one of the things that Brave does we are like okay let's stop being bystanders let's start discussing let's start acting I think this is something that young people are starting to do and we are talking, what should we do about it? Well, I think this is a start, the fact that we are discussing, the fact that we are trying to understand, the fact that we are doing something. So I'm negative, I'm a pessimist, but optimist at the same time. So 
think yes, that's a good thing, more or less. Personally, I find the situation very strange. So on one hand, we have young people who are getting more and more involved into activism and are raising awareness and are getting more informed through social media, through different sources about issues like racism and gender equality and anything else, everything else. But then we have um, right-wing politicians on the rise in Europe and this also is making me kind of afraid of the future and I don't know if the situation is going to change in a matter of like one, two, three, four, five years but I think after younger people are going to start to get more involved in politics and are going to reach an age when they could actively get involved in politics and be politicians or um, candidate for presidency, I think we have a real shot at making change on different levels, or at least try to bring more awareness to these situations. Uh, there are two ways. One is that uh, we combat, yes. We, try to fight uh, discrimination, we try to fight racism and so on, and we have to do that. The other point is that um, fight is not enough in my view. We have, to, we have to check what is in the background, why, what is in the core of this, of this phenomena, of these trends, why some people and believe me, there are some people from the extremists, and Christina is with us. Uh, she shared with me the same experience in this field. Uh, these people uh, do have uh, very concrete uh, problems uh, and arguments why they uh, hate Roma people, why they hate Jews, and so on. Um, we have to speak with them. I know I'm not uh, in the majority of population who says, uh, speaks like this. I just want to say that uh, we have to exactly identify the core of the problems, why, what exactly they say. We have to check what can we do to solve the problem. And then we, share, we can do it uh, uh, and try to eliminate, to handle the problem, to address the problem. So just to fight that to self for to be to be anti-racist or to be against racist, to be against discrimination, fine. But this is just fight one propaganda against another one. This is then this is not enough. So we have to find the problem before, and then if the core is handled, then probably we, we make step forward. It doesn't mean that we should not fight. Don't misunderstand me. We, have, we must do that in parallel. But uh, yeah, we have to find the core of the problems. Does anyone else have something to share or do you have any more questions? Um, about what um, you said, I would like to see the problem that is very frequent in Romania at least. And it's about um, school, school dropout. And I think it's very important and you might help me with some solutions because I think that will um, lead to, I don't know, lack of job perspectives and uh, deviant behavior and stuff like that. And I think that Roma people um, don't continue their studies because they think that the majority will treat them badly anyway. And the majority uh, think that um, I have a reason for treating them like this because um, they don't have education, then they, 
that bad, badly with us. And I think it's just like a, a vicious circle with all this. And I think this is a cause. Um, yeah, uh, very often the Roma students are leaving school uh, before they could finish it because they have to go to work because of their bad educational uh, uh, opportunity. So they they bad educational situation, and and also I think I am not an an expert in education, but I see what uh, they try to make on local level with the students. They they try to engage them with after school activities and uh, non formal educational opportunities. They are providing them out of school, and that's how they start. Also, it's very important. For example, where is the economical situation? Is the problem they provide uh, scholarship? But I would like to highlight here in Hungary, it's not based on their ethnicity. It's based on their economic situation. Um, and also, uh, the, you mentioned this deviancy. It's it's not uh, something that is connected to to Roma communities. So no, it's connected to lack of education. I think that every yeah, it doesn't matter the ethnicity. Yeah, and. As I'm not an expert in education, I can, I can really just say the, this good example that I mentioned, and also the importance to, to, to support the, the children to stay as long as possible into the educational system. And um, because this is, a, the, we know this is one of actually the only opportunity to, to break the, this cycle of poverty. And I know because I, I worked on local level with trauma families. I know the parents know they they know this is their children a uh, chance to to move forward with their life. But so many things can distract a young uh, individual life. So we have to support them. Okay, then if there are no more other questions or like opinions, then I think we've been here for two hours, so I think we can we can finish this this event as well. But again, if you if you have any other opinions or questions, if something comes up afterwards, maybe for especially for your giving for for Sabina for the presentations, you can also share it with us. And I think I speak on behalf of the whole team and me and Carla here. And also uh, to say thank you again to, to Sabina who's not here anymore, but thank you again and to Georgina as well for, for joining us and for sharing uh, from your experience, because that's, I think that was one of the most important things in your presentations because you shared from your experience and from your work and from your knowledge. And of course, thank you to everyone else who participated and you shared your opinions. And it's always very interesting to see different groups of people in European cafes and to see how, what do you think? And especially a lot of young people and what do you think about the topic? So thank you for, for, for taking the time to be here and for, for sharing this with us. I'm gonna let Carla as well to tell you a few words and then I think we can wrap up. Thank you so much. It really was a nice experience and I'm really glad I could uh, help moderate this and have a really nice discussion about this particular issue. And I think it was I think it was uh, really nice. I'm glad we could actually talk about this and go into a lot more ideas than I initially expected. So thank you so much. It really was a pleasure. <laughs> Okay, and also like I know because two hours, maybe it's not enough, especially when it comes to, to racism and discrimination because it's such a like present problem uh, in Europe especially. And it's it has so many aspects that we should we should discuss about and tackle, tackle, but we can also do it in other events together if you're interested in it. And 
one last thing to share the the next uh, shaping the future of Europe event. So on uh, March 18, we're going to have an escape room when where we are also going to discuss through the escape room about the shaping about shaping the future of Europe. And if you liked this format of European Cafe, as I mentioned, we're going to have another one in March on gender and extremism. We're going to have one in April on antisemitism in Europe, and then one in May that's going to be about youth activism. So again, if you are interested in any of these topics, you can follow our page and, and our channels because on Instagram and Facebook and the website, and you can learn more about this, uh, these events and of course about the forum that's going to happen in May. And again, thank you for participating, for sharing your opinions and keep doing that, keep discussing about this. You're gonna keep being an activist and, and keep sharing from your experience. So yes, thank you. And have a really nice weekend. And I really hope this was interesting for, for you as well and made you think about things and about your personal example. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for all of you. Thank you. Bye. bye. All the best. Bye bye. Bye. Have a good day. You too. Bye. Goodbye, guys. Bye, Krista. Bye. And thank you again for, for helping with the girls as well. Sure, no problem. It is my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good uh, weekend. Bye. Ciao.